Oblivion, a Shadow Invasion audiobook. Written by Savage Tempest. Chapter 1 Howard King stumbled down a dimly lit subway tunnel, his head pounding with every step. He couldn't remember the past few days, but it felt like he'd been thrown out of a truck or a window. His arms felt like cement, and his back ached with a strange, dull pain that he couldn't quite place. If this is what it felt like in his thirties, what was going to happen when he hit forty? Thankfully, the thorny pressure inside his head wasn't as bad as it was an hour ago. In a few minutes, it would be gone completely. However, it still reminded King of some of his better hangovers. But he couldn't get drunk now. Not after what the Lazarus Project did to him. Yet here he was, coming back to Lazarus like a chastened puppy. King didn't have health insurance, and Wilson made it very clear that visits to the ER would not be tolerated. Lazarus Project was afraid that some conscientious doctor might stumble upon the nanobots in his system. People might start asking questions. Uncomfortable questions. Wilson had poisoned King with nanobots months ago. Well, poisoned was a bit strong. The nanobots in his blood did quite the opposite. He had been disease-free for how long now? Weeks. Months. Hell. The nanobots can even heal bullet wounds. It took King way too long to make it to Lazarus Project's secret door. Well, not so secret. Anyone could see the door. Anyone who likes walking in abandoned subway tunnels. The orange metal door looked rusted and a little dirty. Unused. King pulled out his keys and tried unlocking it. After a bit of twisting and turning, King felt the door bolt disengage. The door didn't have a handle, so he gave a light push. It didn't budge, so he pushed harder. The heavy door slammed open. There was no one and nothing inside the small room. Only another door. A cleaner door. And not puke orange. King always hated the gray room's chemical smell. Of course, that wasn't the only thing he hated about coming to Lazarus. King tried to shake off the fog in his mind and focus on the present. Something was wrong with him, though he couldn't say what. He needed medical attention, which meant getting inside Lazarus Project. He entered the single door's password a second time. Could they have changed it? He tried again. Frustrated, King slammed his fist into the keypad. Cheap thing busted like crackers. He barely felt a thing. The door slid open and King entered. He was greeted by cheap-looking ribbed metal walls and, and a charcoal gray ceiling, curved just like the subway tunnel he just left. Inside was quiet, except a faint hiss of air conditioning. The neon blue lighting gave Lazarus's hideout a dance club feel. King heard the sound of thumping boots long before he should have. Along with increasing his strength and endurance, the nanobots also improved his hearing. At the other end of the corridor, a squad of agents dressed all up in black and riot gear appeared. Both King's hands shot up. Multiple red dot sights danced on his chest. These guys were very serious. On the floor, now! King started to comply. A bullet stopped him short. King gasped, pain exploding in his liver. These guys were going to kill him. He had to get out of here. Fighting six Lazarus agents armed with FN scar rifles would be stupid. But stupid and King were on close, if reluctant terms. The blockish corridor wasn't large enough for more than three people in a row. It might work in King's favor. If he thought about it too much, though, he might freeze. King launched himself at the three agents in the front as more bullets ripped into him. He fought through the tears and pain racking his body. King forced himself not to think about how one bullet used to take him out of a fight, and here he was now being sprayed with bullets. Sure, the bullets hurt like hell, but by some miracle, he was still able to throw himself into the three agents who had a bead on him. The four of them tumbled to the floor, causing the three agents behind them to scatter out of the way or get pulled down with everyone else. King scrambled to his feet and grabbed one agent's rifle before she could blast him with it, then flipped her over his shoulder and slammed her into one of the fallen agents. King snatched off her glossy black helmet and smacked another agent in the face with it. The man's head snapped back. Next time he'll think twice before trying to come after him from behind. King took four more rounds in the back before he spun around and smacked the offending agent in the side of the head with the rifle he just grabbed. He had to be careful and not kill anyone. If this turned out to be one big misunderstanding, he might have to work with these people one day. And that would be awkward if he killed some of their buddies. And most likely unhealthy. Adrenaline and nanobots fueled King. But there was no way he should be able to take on six Lazarus agents. Especially after getting shot up. But here he was. One fallen agent popped three shots into King's gallbladder. King stomped on the agent's hand, eliciting a scream. 
he snatched the agent up and tossed him into two oncoming agents with barely a grunt. Maybe he would get out of this alive. The tricky thing about overconfidence, though, it usually bites you in the butt. Two tin canisters rolled three quarters of the way down the corridor, spewing all kinds of nasty gas. Poisonous, perhaps. A part of King wondered if his nanobots would save him. His eyes started tearing up. Guess not. He felt dizzy. The other agents didn't seem to be much better off. King thought he saw one agent try to crawl away. She didn't make it three feet. Darkness seized King as he felt himself crumpling to the cement floor. He had to escape. He didn't want to die here. Not with the goddamn Lazarus Project. Chapter 2 King woke up to a stiff back, a collar restraint, and the Lazarus Project's director Wilson regarding him like he was some kind of lab rat. A stern woman in a pants suit and alligator pumps that matched her ginger hair stood next to Wilson. King ignored them and stared straight ahead, taking in as much of his surroundings as he could with his peripheral vision. White circular room, overly bright ceiling lights, no furniture, one door. Hell, he was in the Lazarus Project interrogation room. King made a show of looking at the metal cuffs holding his hands to each side. Plus, he was shackled to a thick metal bar that extended from one side of his semicircle prison to the other. King's new prison rose up nearly to his shoulders. The metal collar around his neck was probably attached to the rest of the metal construct. They were making sure he didn't escape. Welcome back, Howie. Wilson's predatory blue eyes didn't echo his warm, sleazy voice. King wanted to spit on the man, which would get him into trouble. More trouble. This is how you treat the good guys? Wilson dished up a sad, condescending smile. I already told you, Howie. There are no good guys. Just us versus them. I'm Agent Garrison, said the redhead. Her hazel eyes were warm and caring. How are you feeling today, Agent King? The woman had a slight accent, even though she looked pretty American to King. King looked down at his feet. How long had he been standing like this? What was he going to do when he had to pee? Been better, King finally said. Your bullet holes are all healed, said Garrison. Same with the rest of your injuries. Can you tell me why? King looked away from her. Ask Wilson. Good answer, Howie. But Garrison already knows about your nanobots. What she and the rest of us don't know is how you're healing so quickly, even for you. What are you talking about? And where's my shirt? It's being dry cleaned. Wilson's eyes were now on his smartphone. Smug bastard. King knew Wilson was baiting him. Like always. He needed to play this carefully. Wilson wanted something from him, which gave him leverage. Well, a little leverage aside from the wrist cuffs and doggy collar holding him down. Your old shirt and jacket, said Garrison. Lots of holes, blood. We'll get you a new one. Garrison added a soft smile. Promise. Thanks. Garrison wasn't bad looking. Forties. Plenty of curves smoothed out by that expensive suit of hers. King wondered if Wilson was doing her. Nah. She looked far too smart to slum with a guy like Wilson. But she wouldn't be the first woman to be attracted to a man with money and power. Hell, he found money pretty damn sexy too, but not on Wilson. Mind if I ask you another question? Wilson was letting Garrison take the lead. Where have you been for the past three months? What? Agent Garrison's eyes turned calculating. You've been missing for three months, five days. And now you suddenly reappear. You're not funny. I assure you, humor is not what I'm going for. Garrison looked over at Wilson and nodded. That's when King realized she's a shrink. Garrison here is one of our top psychologists. How does he always know what I'm thinking? You're a decent agent, Howie. But like most people, you're an open book. Wilson nodded at Garrison, tapped at his smartphone, then put the thing away. Two burly agents entered the room and posted themselves by the door. Both were cradling assault rifles. Things were about to get... bad. Hazel eyes on King. Garrison removed her smartphone and stepped up to King. Completely unafraid. With him strapped up so nicely, it's not like he could attack her or anything. Besides, Wilson and the two guards would be the first ones he went after anyway. Garrison held out her phone, so he could see closed captions of the audio name playing. She had recorded their conversation. What King found strange was, 
The closed caption words were all in English when he and Wilson spoke, but Garrison's words were in Spanish and sometimes... Italian? They were playing games with him. When did you learn Spanish, Agent King? Asked Garrison. I don't speak Spanish. But you understand it. Italian too, apparently. Garrison played with her phone some more, then showed King a photo of an x-ray of someone's head. There was a section of the brain that was whiter than the rest. Garrison swiped left and showed King a close-up of the x-ray. The white section. That's an implant right in the Wernicke side of your brain. Garrison continued before King could ask who the hell Wernicke was. The Wernicke area is the part of the brain that is associated with language comprehension. You're a regular Rosetta Stone, Howie. Metaphorically speaking. King didn't believe the Lazarus Project director, and he didn't believe Agent Garrison either. He would know if he had an implant in his brain. You're making all this up. I'm afraid not, Agent King. Doc Stevens thinks you can understand any language with your implant. Garrison gave King another warm and fake smile. We really need to know who put this inside you. King looked past Garrison and Wilson to the guards, posted at the White Room's door. If he could just get out of these cuffs, he could probably take them. After getting slugged with bullets, hopefully not in the face, it took two days before his last eye grew back. I don't know what you're talking about. Wilson, his eyes bordering between startling and creepy, snapped his fingers. The shorter agent at the door strode over, assault rifle aimed at King's chest. King didn't recognize the agent, but Lazarus Project was a very big organization. Wilson used his index finger to tilt the agent's nozzle toward King's face. If he escapes, shoot him in the left eye. Wilson straightened his designer suit jacket and exchanged places with Garrison. Her eyes never left King as Wilson walked his fingers across King's bare arm. Nice muscle tone, Howie. King refused to show his discomfort and kept his face straight ahead. He knew Wilson wasn't gay, but the Lazarus director did like to play mind games. A flash of metal in King's peripheral vision was his only warning as Wilson jammed six inches of steel into his right bicep. King gasped. Eventually his brain caught up with his body as he stared at Wilson's broken switchblade. He wasn't in any pain, no blood. It had to be a trick knife. It's not a trick, Howie. Wilson handed the broken switchblade to Garrison. Show him. Garrison offered King a sad and surprisingly honest smile. Thanks a lot, Agent King. Eyes on his, Garrison took the, the remainder of the broken blade and sliced a shallow cut across her palm. Blood oozed out immediately. Garrison stepped forward and showed King her bleeding palm. So I ask you again, where have you been for the past three months? Chapter 3 Three months ago, King lay on the ground, pain consuming him. He'd never been shot before. The first bullet hit him in the leg, felt like shards of glass dancing inside his tibial nerve or something. The other two bullets struck him in the chest. One of them grazed his heart. Last one punctured his left lung. Get up, King. You're not hurt. That bad. Wilson was right. Yes, King's mind was telling him that he should be shock and dying right now. The nanobots in his system, however, had already stopped the bleeding. King could almost feel the bullet holes closing up as he forced himself to his feet. Breathing was coming easier, too. Mind going after those right-wing extremists before they start killing hostages? King was tempted to tell the Lazarus Project director to go screw himself, but fighting down his vertigo was zapping all of his attention. A minute later, maybe two, King felt as good as new. No, better than new. His new nanobots not only repaired any damage to his body, they also increased his speed and strength. One quick scan, there. King's magnum lay on the ground not six feet away. King didn't like the gun much. Yes, it had a nice grip and everything, but the recoil was annoying. But this is the weapon Lazarus gave him for the mission, so he would use it, if he had to. Snatching the magnum up, King played out different scenarios of how he could take down the guys who shot him. Each scenario, though, left King being gunned down again and again. Why are you standing there, Howie? Doc Stevens says your vitals are back to normal. If you're scared of the big old bad men, you can go hide in the corner and wait for Hayes and Maddox to clean them up for you. Typical Wilson. Even on a mission, the man couldn't squeeze enough insults in. I've got eyes on the hostages. 
What about the sniper who took down King? Maddox got him. Good job, Hayes. How many targets do we have left? Two inside and two patrolling the outside of the building. There's also one guarding the front door. Maddox spotted the other two near the station's cooling tower. That had to be where their extremists were going to plant the bombs. On the plus side, the geothermal energy station wasn't in a residential area. The bad thing, though, was King didn't have any training in defusing bombs. Neither did Maddox or Hayes for all King knew. This is how we'll play it. Hayes, you and Maddox secure the hostages while our hero, King, takes out the guys planting the bombs. Roger that. Roger that. Maddox and Hayes whispered at the same time. King? Yeah, I heard you. Walking as quietly as he could, King tried to keep out of sight as much as possible. The mid-afternoon sun provided plenty of shadows. Not forty feet away, crouched by the base of the cooling tower, were his targets. These guys didn't look anything like terrorists, or even white nationalists. They looked like... ordinary guys. Ordinary guys with rifles and bombs. Well, at least they left the assault weapons at home. You ready yet, King? Hayes' voice in his ear. Unlike Wilson, Hayes was a professional, and a solid team leader. I've got eyes on our bombers, said King. Good, said Hayes. On my mark, you take them out. Me and Maddox will take care of the folks guarding the hostages. King gritted his teeth as he inched closer to the extremists, his magnum gripped tightly in his hand. The power plant buzzed with mechanical activity, a low hum permeating the air. Steam rose from the geothermal vents, sometimes obscuring King's view of the two men planting explosives at the cooling tower. He needed to be careful. One bad shot, and everything goes boom. King didn't have to wait long for Hayes to give him the green light. King took a deep breath, feeling the heat of the sun on his back, and charged forward. The terrorists hesitated, probably stunned by seeing a dead man running toward them. Get him! cried one good old boy. Bullets whizzed past King, the sound of gunfire echoing throughout the plant, shattering the peaceful silence. King felt his adrenaline surge as he tried zigzagging and making himself as small a target as possible while he fired back. He could smell the C4's oily odor even from a distance, but King focused on trying not to get hit by too many bullets. One bullet took out most of his right ear. King continued firing his magnum, the recoil jolting through his body. One of the extremists fell to the ground, a bullet hole in his chest. His buddy eyed King with fear, but continued planting the C4. He was ready to die for his cause. Crap. King's heart raced as he closed in, totally focused on stopping the bomb. If it exploded, it could knock out a large portion of California's power grid. King tackled the remaining extremist, their bodies colliding with a thud, thankfully away from the C4. The man fought back and was fairly large if not muscled. It wasn't enough. King made it to his feet first and kicked him in the side. That gave King enough time to snatch up the dead extremist's rifle and start beating his buddy over the head with it. Stop! I give up, man! King whacked him one more time, then tossed the rifle. King pointed his magnum at the terrorist. Hands up. The man did what he was told. My targets are down, said King. Good, said Agent Maddox as he strode toward them. Any trouble? King shook his head. Afraid I had to kill one. Maddox grinned. Then he fired point blank at the surviving terrorist's face. King jumped back and not just because of the blood. What did you do that for? He gave up. Maddox's grin spread into a full-blown smile. It's the Lazarus way, man. Chapter 4 Wilson and Garrison were still spouting nonsense at him, but King really wasn't listening. He was too focused on the feelings in his arms. Or rather, the lack of feeling. Yeah, he could still feel the sensation of smooth skin when he rubbed his fingers together. So why didn't he feel any pain when Wilson stabbed him? No blood. No redness. Not even a scar. King twisted his neck as much as the metal collar allowed him to. His arms looked like they always did. A little more muscular, maybe. And completely hairless. King desperately wanted out of this stupid dog collar and cuffs. Agent King, said Garrison in her patient shrink voice. Please pay attention. Director Wilson and I want to help you. But we need you to tell us where you went after the power plant mission. You want to help me so much? Why not get me out of these? King wiggled his hands. He could barely move them thanks to the metal cuffs. Garrison appraised King with calm, knowing eyes. I'm afraid if we did release you right now, you would attack the director. What did you do to me? Wasn't us, Howie. Wilson looked over at Garrison. Show him. 
Garrison stepped back up onto King's prison platform and aimed her phone screen at him. It was another X-ray. A full-body one this time. The high-resolution image was a skeleton with lots of gray and shadows. It was the ghost-white parts of the body that gave him a bad feeling. This is an X-ray of you, Agent King. As far as we can tell, your bones have been reinforced with titanium. Reinforced? That made no sense. King didn't believe Garrison for a minute, but he wanted to know more. Had to know more. Why are my arms all white? Garrison went quiet. King could tell that she was calculating the best way to answer. I'm sorry, Agent King. These aren't your arms. King chuckled. Of course they're my arms. King wiggled his fingers again. See? Garrison stepped off the platform as she addressed Wilson. You tell him. Wilson had a familiar evil, psychotic gleam in his eyes. Okay, here's the truth, Howie. Someone amputated your arms and stuck you with cybernetic limbs. Care to tell us who did the slicing? King jerked his arms, or at least tried to, but the constraints holding him to the metal bar held fast. He was going to kill Wilson. The guard and garrison, too, if they got in the way. Grunting, King tried pulling his arms away from the railing holding him. This time, though, he could feel it budging. Wilson held his hand up to stop the agent from shooting him the face. That was going to be the last mistake the Lazarus director made once King got out of these constraints. Garrison put an end to his hopes. She walked straight up to him and jammed something into the side of his neck. King felt all the tension and his anger drain out of him. He felt calm. When he looked up, Garrison was once again standing next to Wilson in her pretty, pretty alligator pumps, watching him. I gave you something to help you feel better, Agent. How long will it last? Asked Wilson. Garrison shrugged. With his nanobots working even more efficiently now? I don't know. This couldn't be happening. They were lying to him, testing him. No one cut off his arms, and even if someone did, there are no prosthetics that look as real as this. Wilson was playing another of his stupid head games. This is not a game, Howie. Despite the drug Garrison gave him, King could feel his heart rate increase. You... you amputated my arms? Wilson shook his fat head. I keep telling you, Howie, we didn't do it. Lazarus Project doesn't have that kind of technology. No one on the planet has. Liar, was all King could manage. Absolutely, said Wilson. But not about this. We don't even know what your arms are made of, besides the titanium. What we do know is that your new arms are stronger and faster than your original pair. Garrison held up her stupid phone again, probably testing to see if he could see it from a distance. He could. It was a photo of... something. Weird. Luminescent green to the point of almost glowing. The thing looked the size of a quarter. Fleshy and gelatin at the same time, the creepy thing almost seemed to pulse like it was alive or something. We think it might be some kind of tracking device. It's organic. Doc Stevens removed it from the base of your skull. Meaning they probably did all kinds of nasty things to him while he was passed out, including removing his arms. Don't worry, Howie. We've taken measures to block the signal. Who did this to you, Agent King? The Russians, maybe. You're not amusing, Howie. I already told you, humans don't have the kind of technology you're sporting. You're crazy. Both of you. Wilson snorted. You take down six Lazarus agents in under three minutes and think nothing about it. Now that's crazy. Let's face the facts, Howie. You're a weapon now. The question is... Whose? Chapter 5 Four months earlier. King wasn't really into stealing. Borrowing he was okay with. And if you're stupid enough to leave incriminating goodies on your computer, well, you're pretty much begging for it. King flipped the light switch and quietly slipped into the room. He didn't even have to pick the lock to get into Jackson's office. Not when you're a lowly old guard. Lucky for him, the senator's security personnel screening wasn't very rigorous. Playing security guard for the last month sucked big time but now it was all paying off. The tired off-white office was nice and empty, so King quickly made his way past the grandfather clock and over to Jackson's desk. Six minutes, maybe seven before they would miss him downstairs. Plenty of time. King booted up Jackson's dinosaur computer and removed the flash drive from his breast pocket. 
The USB slots was located on the computer monitor. The computer seemed to take forever to boot, giving King time to wonder what made Wilson so sure that there was useful information on Jackson's computer. King would be surprised if this thing was even hooked up to the internet. Computer fully booted, the flash drive finally started to blink. According to Wilson, all he had to do was plug it in, and the flash drive would do all the work. But then again, the Lazarus project director says a lot of things. There was a noise outside the room. Damn. King barely made it out of the chair before the door swung open. It was one of the senator's aides, Rubens or something. What are you doing here? Rubens' dark eyes looked more hungry than they did accusing. A little creepy, too. Rubens shut the door behind him all quiet-like and smiled at King. Very creepy. Briefly reminding King of Wilson, or a blue cheese bacon cheeseburger left out for a day or two. Just do my rounds. King stepped from behind the desk with his best, let's be pals smile. This idiot was ruining everything. An elbow strike should knock the wimp out. Why here so late? Rubens mirrored King's movements, effectively stepping out of striking range while simultaneously blocking King from the door. I smell your fear. Drool was actually dripping from Ruben's mouth. Nah, that's aftershave, you smelling friend. Doesn't matter. Ruben's jaw slowly elongated into a stubby snout. I'm hungry either way. Jackson's aide was transforming right in front of King. Shark teeth, silver claws, Christ. This could not be happening, but it was. Ruben's leapt at King like a goddamn wolf or something. King rolled to the right, letting Ruben's own weight carry the aide past him. But Ruben's or whatever the hell he'd become was back on his feet in seconds. King already had his trusty Marlin out, so he plugged Ruben's with four 350-grain bullets, center mass. That slowed the creep down. A little. King sat at a black marble oval table in one of Lazarus Project's many conference rooms. The boxy room was dimly lit with track lighting. Across from him sat Agent Nelson and Wilson, the latter eyeing him with skepticism. So you killed the senator's aide, why? Wilson wore a patient smile on his rich boy face, but his startling blue eyes were nothing less than predatory. Agent Prime Nelson was seated to Wilson's left, all blonde and attractive if a little too intense. He met her before, but she pretty much ignored him. I had no choice. Jackson's aide caught me with my hand in the cookie jar, and before I could sweet-talk him, he turned into a goddamn monster. Elongated jawline with humongous razor-sharp teeth. Wilson read from King's report, and then looked up. And sharp silver claws that glisten softly in the moonlight. I didn't say anything about moonlight and glistening. Wilson frowned. You might as well have, Howie. Wilson turned his creepy blue eyes on Nelson. Do we have anything in the Lazarus database matching this twilighty description? Nelson kept her features neutral as she shook her head. And news feeds say nothing unusual about the aide's body. Nelson's raven eyes targeted King next. And Agent King has no visible wounds. You think I'm making this up? Nah. Wilson's blubbery lips widened into a familiar leer. But mysteries always give me a boner. Bordering on sexual harassment, aren't we? Wilson's bright eyes lit up with feigned panic. Oh no. Does this mean you're going to report me to H.R.? Wilson turned his attention to Nelson's boobs. Is the information from the aide's computer any good? Nelson didn't seem bothered by Wilson's attention, preferring to keep her lovely dark eyes on King. Very useful for our purposes, but I didn't have time to make a copy. That can wait. Wilson was watching King again. The Crimson Syndicate is becoming more a problem these days. Let's hit them where it hurts. Their pocketbook. Nelson slid a thin sheet to King's side of the table. Howie, we have it on good information that Ephemera, the current head of those crimson criminals, is in cahoots with some celebrity artist known as Leonardo Rosenberg. Wilson seemed to make a point of memorizing the contours of Nelson's boobs before rising from the briefing table. I don't care which one of you sleeps with him. Just get Rosenberg to sell his next set of ugly-ass paintings straight from his studio. Wilson buttoned the top of his too tight suit, then strutted over to the door. He turned back just as the door slid open. Don't worry, Howie, baby. I actually expect you to blow this mission. The jerk winked at King to emphasize his point. 
The door slid quietly behind him. When King returned his gaze to Nelson, she was staring at him. Want to get some coffee before we get started? Nelson frowned at King. I think Wilson's more your type. How's that? You both have the conscience of a trap, rattlesnake. Ouch. But at least she provided a good view when she left. Chapter 6 In King's mind, art galleries were all the same. White walls, mandatory high ceilings, and butt-ugly paintings. Leonardo Rosenberg's gallery was no different. King pretended to be vaguely interested as he and Agent Nelson contemplated the gruesome images in front of them. Angels with bloodied swords, almost as big as their giant wings, spread over a landscape of rocks and severed heads, most of them belonging to females. The entire gallery was filled with paintings like this, red skies and blue-eyed angels slaughtering one another. King leaned over a little closer to Agent Nelson. She had ditched yesterday's uniform and was actually looking quite hot with her recent makeover and tight black dress. People actually pay for this? Nelson kept her dark eyes on the painting. Millions. Well, may I say, Agent Nelson, that you look like a million? What could have been an inviting smile spread across Nelson's glossy red lips? You're not my type, King. So, what is your type? Nelson faced King and placed her long arms around his neck and looked up at him. Not stupid. In here, I thought I was the next Einstein. Einstein wouldn't keep poking a tiger and not expect to lose a limb. Wilson. Again. The Lazarus Project director was killing his game even miles away. King was tempted to argue the point, but they both sensed someone approaching. Nelson untangled her hands from around King as they both turned to face a predictably attired all-in-black, Leonardo Rosenberg approaching them. Forties. Soft. Taller than King. Twenty or twenty-five pounds lighter. Some women would probably find him attractive. Possibly even Nelson. But King wasn't sure since the Lazarus agent hadn't been kind enough to state just how many IQ points a potential mate had to have to be considered worthy. Leonardo, to his credit, scanned them quickly as he brightened his smile and quickened his pace toward them. Olivia? Nelson extended her right hand, which Leonardo quickly grasped and expertly maneuvered to his lips. The black eyes, however, were on King as he kissed Nelson's hand. King frowned just enough to let him know not to try that crap on him, and then offered his hand, which Leonardo greedily claimed with both of his, and shook King's hand like he was the goddamn president. Well, Leonardo said, finally releasing King's hand, You certainly got my attention, Olivia. With that $10,000 deposit in my bank account, and just for a 30-minute consultation? Apparently, old Leo was sharper than he looked. 10,000. Impressive. When he was first interviewed by Wilson, King thought Wilson got his money from his daddy. But the more time that he spent around the Lazarus director, the more King suspected this probably wasn't the case. Wilson had his fingers in lots of places. I have to be honest, Mr. Rosenberg. Nelson squeezed Leonardo's bicep and smiled as she snuggled up to him. The money was a small gesture of goodwill, an offer for a possible collaboration. You have to call me Leonardo. The black eyes smiled promises. Everyone does. Leonardo's dark eyes were in charm mode as they shifted to King. So what do they call you, Mr. Rough Trade? King. Two hours later. Wasting two hours of his life chatting with the world revolves around me, Leo, left King in a pissy mood as he and Nelson headed down the alley toward her car. Leonardo let them out the back way, claiming that it would get them to their car faster. Maybe. But it was also the smellier way, and getting darker by the second. Maybe Leonardo was trying to tell them something. You could have been nicer. Nelson's voice had lost all of its previous velvety sweetness. Well, one of us had to play hard to get. The slap came from nowhere. He should have expected it, but he had never been backhanded before. Which, given his past, was saying something. King wasn't sure what hurt more. The bitch slap, or the fact that Nelson caught him by surprise. King wanted to touch his face to make certain that she didn't draw any blood, but he wasn't going to give the Lazarus agent the satisfaction. If this is your attempt at foreplay, King said, it's not working for me. Nelson struck again, but this time King slapped her hand down before it could connect. Her kick to his side was faster, but he managed to pivot just enough with his waist and forearms to block the brunt of the kick. 
King didn't know what the hell was wrong with Nelson or why it was suddenly pitch black outside. But instincts are instincts, and King's were survival at all costs. King swept his foot against Nelson's ankle while she still had one foot in the air, and down she went. To her credit, she managed to land on her nice ass. But she surprised King for the second time today when she snatched a 9mm Glock from her purse and aimed it at him. Sure, shooting from your butt is precarious at best, but there was no way he could pull his marlin out in time. Nelson fired, twice. Pain exploded in King's right shoulder. Nelson fired again as he doubled over. King felt a breeze just miss his head, but luckily he had the good sense to roll for all he was worth. Nelson was now back on her feet, and she was aiming her glock at the thing that just swiped at King with its nasty silver claws. Did the senator's aide come back from the dead? Stop it. That's crazy thinking. Of course, King used to think a lot of things were crazy before he joined the Lazarus Project. Now his right shoulder had a big gash in it, and it wouldn't be long before adrenaline lost out to his body going into a state of shock. But he had to focus. That thing, looking just like the black monster that attacked him in Senator Jackson's office, was bobbing over toward Nelson, who was still blasting it with her Glock. A small weapon like that had 17 rounds at most, meaning she had one or two more shots left. He needed to do something. Quick. But he couldn't. Yeah. He had managed to remove his marlin from his shirt holster, but he could barely lift his right arm, let alone shoot with it. If he were an action hero, he could easily shoot with either hand. But of course, this was real life, and he had never been a hero. Nelson was seconds away from having her head removed by that, whatever it is. He couldn't let that happen. Another round fired, leaving Nelson with just one shot left. The monster paused slightly and the darkness around them quivered. Since when does darkness quiver? Which gave King an idea. A wild and crazy idea. Something that he was used to. With his good hand, King awkwardly pulled out one of those cheesy flare pens. Ignoring the pain in his right shoulder, and surprised that he hadn't dropped his weapon, King held his left hand high like the Statue of Liberty, and popped the pen's tab open with his thumb. Up shot a surprisingly bright flare. The monster wailed as it looked up toward the skyrocketing flare and the dissipating darkness that had temporarily surrounded them. Nelson capped the thing in the throat with her last bullet. It couldn't scream now, but it did melt. Chapter 7 Getting clawed by a monster, apparently, was one way for King to get Nelson's hands on him. But the woman was all business as she expertly redressed the wound on his shoulder. King was definitely happy that his wound wasn't really hurting anymore. Strange, said Nelson. I could have sworn your wound was deeper. I'm not complaining, though my body could use a little food. Nelson snipped another piece of medical gauze wrapping and went into the kitchen. Her apartment wasn't particularly big, but certainly comfortable enough for two people. Quite clean, too. Not surprising. Doc Stevens had given him a bunch of shots and antibiotics last night, and his dressing seemed just fine but Nelson insisted on cleaning the wound again before they went to see old Leonardo a second time, and who was he to refuse his new if only temporary partner, especially since she had her makeup face back on? Sure, Nelson looked nice without makeup, but there's something special about red lipstick and eyeshadow on the right woman. Hell, any woman actually, especially when they play all hard to get. Nelson returned and tossed two protein bars at King. He caught them easily with his left hand, and had the first one in his mouth in seconds. I'm not sure why Wilson has taken such an interest in you, King. Hey, I killed that thing, didn't I? Ouch. Go easy. I thought I was the one who shot the creature. Nelson was almost finished wrapping his shoulder wound. I apologize, by the way. For what? For slapping you. I don't know what happened. I lost control. Don't worry about it. At least you didn't shoot me. Nelson's dining room chair gave King just the right height to occasionally sneak a peek at her boobies while she finished patching him up. Gotta love those plunging necklines. Nelson had the candles going, and the fancy tablecloth and flowers suggested that this could be his best mission yet. Still, it was hard to imagine that Nelson would dress up and light candles for a guy she calls stupid. Plus, they were supposed to meet Leonardo soon. Nelson stopped for a moment and looked down at King. This is one game you can't win, King. I like it when you call me King. For a second there, it almost seemed like she wanted to smile. 
Lazarus Project doesn't accept failure. Got it? Fine. But you sleep with old Leo. I'm not into guys. Really? This time Nelson did smile. Should we confirm that with your buddy, Miguel? King opened his mouth for a quick retort, but was cut off when the doorbell rang. Nelson left him for the door, and in walked Leonardo Rosenberg. Leonardo, King said, his blue eyes targeting Nelson. What a surprise. Nelson ignored King as she took Leonardo by the arm and ushered him to the table. What happened to your shelter? Leonardo's black eyes seemed more concerned about King's exposed chest. We were attacked, King said. Right outside your gallery. Leonardo's face went pale. That's horrible. He turned to Nelson. I feel so bad. How can I make it up to you? I'll hold you to that promise, Leonardo, Nelson said, smiling all flirtatious-like. But first, we're going to have a lovely Thai red curry shrimp dinner. Then, you're going to agree to sell us at least two of your amazing paintings. And after that, you're going to tell me whom you want to sleep with. Me? Or the dude with the missing shirt? Leonardo's slim features went from pale to flustered pink. His self-confidence quickly returned as Kings went out the door. Honestly, Olivia, said Leonardo, eyeing both her and King like they were tonight's dinner. I'm feeling extra hungry tonight. Lazarus Headquarters Wilson strutted into the conference room in yet another tailor-made suit. The Lazarus director sat down next to Nelson without saying a word. He checked his phone before setting it down on the table, then picked up the yellow folder in front of him. He snorted and set the folder back down and looked across the table at King. One of those kind of nights, Howie? Not the kind you're used to, King said. No puppies were drowned. Wilson's predatory blue eyes were still smiling as he looked over to Nelson, who was now makeup-free and had her hair pulled into a tight blonde ponytail. She was doing pretty well pretending she wasn't pissed. Maybe he should have made her breakfast before sneaking out this morning. Well done, said Wilson. Both of you. He placed the folder back onto the black marble table. The man was actually wearing cufflinks, probably real gold too. The contract looks good. We should have two of Rosenberg's hideous paintings within the next two days. I still don't get it, King said. How does purchasing Rosenberg's painting hurt Crimson? Nelson's mouth tightened, but King didn't care. Well, maybe a little. It's elementary, my dear Howie. Howard. Intel suggests that ephemera, which is a stupid name if you ask me, well, ephemera is not only a criminal mastermind, she's also into art. The woman has invested millions of dollars into Rosenberg, and he makes that money back and more. But only because Rosenberg's paintings are sold exclusively through auction houses. Now that we'll have two of his originals, we're going to sell them for pennies on the dollar. Therefore, tanking their value. What about Rosenberg? Wilson practically glowed with pride. Oh, he'll be ruined. A part of King felt bad. Sure, Leonardo was a bit of a pompous ass, but he wasn't a bad guy. And the man does give good head. King made an effort to clean up his thoughts. Nelson was watching him. What about the shadow people? Nelson said. Wilson frowned. Mention of the shadow people noticeably soured the Lazarus director's happy mood. Shadow what? Shadow people. The creatures that attacked me and King. Wilson waved away Nelson's concern. Besides a few random incidents, Senator Jackson and Rosenberg seem to be the only connection we have. We'll continue monitoring the situation. But that's all, Nelson, said Wilson, rising from the table. You too, King. You know, you both look tired. Why don't the two of you take the rest of the day off? Get some sleep, if you can. Chapter 8 The Present King continually scanned his surroundings as he made his way down Santa Monica Boulevard. Twice he caught himself clutching his grocery bags as he took in the tension around him. People rushed by avoiding all eye contact, 
their faces filled with fear and anxiety. Something definitely was wrong. Garrison had warned him that people were on the brink of panic, too many people gone missing, and a lot of other weird stuff was happening. King wasn't sure if he believed Garrison. She did work for Lazarus Project, after all. Aliens? Didn't seem possible. Then again, these damn cybernetic arms shouldn't be possible either. Lazarus released King a day and a half ago, letting him go home. He was supposed to check in with them once every day. They probably have someone following him, even though he hadn't spotted a tail so far. It's not like he wanted to go out. He had no choice. For once, Wilson wasn't lying. King had been gone for three months. His calendar and fridge proved that. Even with his cybernetic hands, King didn't really want to clean out his fridge. Nothing but spoiled food and moldy lab experiments in there. Three months? Gone. King kept moving. Wondering if the black, oily, werewolf-like creatures he fought months ago had anything to do with the supposed aliens. King also found himself wondering if Agent Nelson was dating anyone. He was so lost in thought he didn't see the Asian kid until it was too late leaning against a building by the corner. Upon closer inspection, King noticed the upside-down lightning bolt tattoo under the kid's left eye. And he was no kid. Seventeen, at least. Lean, jeans too baggy. Got the time, man? King looked at him, startled enough to stop. What? Stopping was a mistake. King sensed someone coming up from behind. He spun around. A black kid and a white kid approached him. Teenagers, King corrected himself. Their clothes suggested that they weren't gangbangers, but they did have an edge to them, and now all three of them had surrounded him. The passing pedestrian traffic went out of their way not to notice, no doubt relieved that it wasn't them being harassed. King saw the Asian teen pull out a knife, or maybe it was a switchblade. Didn't matter. The groceries, man. Go ahead. Take them. Pass them over to my butt. Your money, too. Fine. King turned around and held out the two paper bags. The teen snatched them from his hands. King hit the teen on his left with an inside leg kick, causing the teen's legs to buckle. He grabbed his buddy's head and slammed into the kid he just kicked. King spun around just as the Asian teen thrusted his knife at him. A simple tap on the hand deflected the blow past his side. King floored him with an uppercut. Now people were openly gaping. One guy had his phone out, recording. Erase it. The man nodded, tapped his phone twice, and showed King his phone. Much obliged. Mr. Cameraman took off in a hurry. King sighed, taking in his fallen groceries and the stupid teenagers. All three were down, and he wasn't even sweating. Was this another test from Lazarus? Hopefully even they weren't that low as to use kids, but he couldn't exactly put it past the covert organization. Ruthless didn't come close to describing the Lazarus project. King stomped on the white teen's back, winning him a muffled gasp. He bent down to retrieve what was left of his groceries. That's when he heard the screams, cars honking, the roaring of the ocean. Ocean? King looked up, and his heart sank. His brain warred against what he was seeing. A giant black tidal wave, two stories high, was surging down the streets toward him. People started running away from the crashing tide. Some ran into nearby stores. Drivers abandoned their cars. King tried to figure out what to do as people slammed into him in their rush to get away. How's her? A motorcycle appeared out of nowhere, driven by Miguel. King had never been more grateful to see his friend as he called out to him, urging King to jump on the back of the bike. It wasn't easy getting to Miguel through the panicking crowd. He managed it without roughing up anyone up too badly. Hold tight, said Miguel, flipping his helmet visor down. King found himself stupidly worrying about not wearing a helmet as Miguel expertly weaved through the frozen traffic. The wind whipped through King's hair and nose, so he repositioned his head closer to Miguel's shoulder as his hands tightened around Miguel's waist. Hey! shouted Miguel over the roar of the engine. Ease up a bit. Sorry. King hadn't realized that he was holding on so tightly to Miguel, hurting his friend with his damn cybernetic hands. King made the mistake of looking back. The black wave was enveloping everyone in sight. He felt even worse when he realized that the black tide chasing them wasn't water. King didn't know what it was. King gritted his teeth as Miguel swerved and zigzagged for the millionth time. Expertly dodging debris and abandoned cars as the black tide raged behind them, its deafening roar filling King's ears. A couple of times, Miguel drove them onto the sidewalk. King would be surprised if they didn't hit someone. People cursed them out, and one guy fell. But thankfully, Miguel didn't run over anybody. 
Soon they were accelerating down a straightaway. King caught a glimpse of the towering wave in his peripheral vision. It was at least twenty feet high and moving faster than anything that big had a right to. King did his best to fight down the rising panic in his chest. Until now, he had never ridden on motorcycle before. He didn't even know that Miguel knew how to drive one of these things. Lucky for both of them, he did. King wondered if there was such a thing as motorcycle sickness, as Miguel turned a sharp corner and headed down a side street, a dead-end street. There was no way they were going to outrun the black tide. Miguel revved the engine. King wanted to tell him to stop. Instead, he leaned into Miguel's leather back and tried to brace for impact. This was going to hurt. Miguel's tires screeched as he swerved right and slammed into a metal gate. The gate crashed open, and they burst into a dimly lit parking garage. They shot up the ramp to the second level, then the third, and slid to a stop. King wasn't sure whether to hug Miguel or hit him. You must got us killed, smart guy. Miguel yanked off his flashy helmet and pointed to the street. No, I saved us. They both watched the city below as the wave's mist started to clear. King found himself questioning his own sanity. The cars were parked and cluttered on the road like they were before the wave. There were no signs of damage or even a scratch on their shiny surfaces. The stores, buildings, everything looked as if they had not been touched. Except for the people. Gone. Like a ghost town. I thought that was water, said Miguel, sounding as stunned as King felt. No, it's how the aliens abduct people. Two hours later, Miguel helped King carry the plastic grocery bags into his tiny kitchen. The rectangular space barely had enough room for two people to stand shoulder to shoulder. At least the place was rent-stabilized. King felt Miguel watching him as he shoved cans into the cabinets and tossed perishables into the refrigerator and freezer. Lucky for him, he still had at least one credit card not maxed out since the Lazarus Project didn't pay him while he was missing. King closed the last cabinet door and stared at his best friend. You were in contacts or something? Miguel shook his head, confused. No. Why? Your eyes. They seem... different. Brighter. That's because I'm a good-looking guy. Yeah, you keep telling yourself that. Maybe it was the kitchen light, but in all the years that King had known Miguel, his buddy's eyes were always a washed-out blue. King's mother used to tell him that his sea-blue eyes were his best physical feature. Unfortunately, they also reminded her of King's father. He decided to let the matter rest. It really wasn't important anyway. There was something else he needed to know. Were you telling me? Miguel was never a particularly good liar, and this time was no different. What makes you say that? You gonna try and tell me that you just rode up today like some knight in shining armor? Okay. Lazarus wants to make certain that you're all right. Now that was funny. The Lazarus Project cared about results, not its agents. It was either me or someone else. I'm sorry, okay? King shook his head. No, it's me who's sorry. I'm the one who got you involved in Lazarus in the first place. Since we're being honest, what makes you think the Black Tide is used for abductions? Black Tide. That's what people were calling it. According to the Darknet, they've been popping up more and more lately. Call it a feeling, King finally said. A feeling? Or a memory? King shrugged. Hey. Miguel leaned against King's fridge. Is it true that you took down ten Lazarus agents the other day? That won him a chuckle from King. <laughs> no, there were only six of them. Miguel smiled back before turning thoughtful. How do you feel? King stared at him, forcing himself not to scowl. What do you mean? For a few seconds, Miguel had the good sense to look embarrassed. Then he moved closer. His eyes shot to King's arms, then back up to his face. They say you... got your arms replaced. Didn't realize Lazarus was such a gossip machine. So it's true, isn't it? Those aren't your real arms? I don't want to talk about it. King left Miguel in the kitchen and pulled out one of two dining room chairs and plopped down. It really wasn't much of a dining room since it was connected to the living room area. Miguel regarded him from the kitchen's cheesy entrance. Can I touch it? King was so not liking where this conversation was going. Bad enough he screwed over Leonardo. King sure as hell didn't want to mess things up with his best buddy. Miguel was persistent, though, 
and King eventually gave in. He avoided looking at Miguel as he stripped off his shirt. Miguel's fingers were more callous than Garrison's, but definitely not creepy like Wilson touching his skin, or whatever covered his reinforced bones. Well, they look the same. No more hair, though. Can you feel this? Asked Miguel, circling his fingers on King's tricep. King did not like what he was feeling. He shrugged Miguel's stupid hand off him. His phone rang. King avoided eye contact as Miguel moved away. Hello? Hope I'm not interrupting anything, Howie. But we need you and Miguel at HQ. Now. King glanced over at Miguel, whose cheeks were flushed. We're on our way. Chapter 9 They met in the briefing room this time, which was kind of set up like a classroom. School definitely wasn't one of King's fondest memories, except maybe for trigonometry. It was the only math class he ever got an A in, thanks to Miss Walden, who had the biggest... King noticed Wilson watching him, so he cleaned up his thoughts. The Lazarus director had a real bad knack for knowing what was on King's mind. Agent Nelson, still looking lovely after all these months, and Stern, was seated next to Agent Maddox, so King sat down with Miguel. Nelson watched him sit, but said nothing. Agent Garrison and Doc Stevens were seated at the front desk on the left side of the room. King and Miguel were in the right front row. King glanced meaningfully around the room a second time. Nelson now pretended not to notice him, but Agent Maddox winked and nodded. It wasn't a friendly greeting. More like one asshole saying hello to another. King decided not to even think about why Nelson would sit next to such a loser like Maddox. The man had the kind of face that enjoyed one too many fistfights. King turned back around. Lazarus Project had its share of yahoos, but Maddox was also a bully. The kind of bully who likes to shoot people. Even unarmed ones like the extremist at the energy plant who give themselves up. That type of bully. One day, he and Maddox would tussle. It was one of those inevitable things. Like going to the dentist and bank penalty fees. Inevitable. King once again found himself bitterly thinking about his cybernetic arms. When they did wind up scrapping, Maddox would find himself missing some teeth, among other things. Miguel leaned over to King. He's not the kind of guy to mess with. King kept his eyes straight ahead. You're talking about me, right? That earned him a grin from Miguel. King couldn't help but notice that there were no guards present. The last time he was at HQ, Lazarus had him shackled in the interrogation room with two beefy guards ready to shoot him. But now, Lazarus Project seemed to be trusting him again. Or maybe they just wanted something from him. Yeah, they wanted something. Egomaniac that he is, Wilson made a show of positioning himself center stage of the sparse and overly beige briefing room. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your rapid response to this rather sudden meeting. Everyone here has clearance enough to know that we're dealing with an existential threat. Maddox snorted. You mean they're going to cancel the Super Bowl? Wilson targeted his disgust at Agent Garrison. Why did we invite the meet to this meeting? Garrison kept her expression pleasant as she explained that Agent Maddox would be going on the mission. Wilson's predatory eyes shifted back to Maddox before continuing with the briefing. Okay. People are going missing all around the world. Which coincides with tonight's black tide incident, added Garrison. King was surprised when Miguel spoke up. King and I narrowly avoided the black tide a few hours ago. Garrison didn't look surprised. We've been hearing reports that the black tide has appeared in Berlin, London, St. Petersburg, Shanghai. No one said anything for a few moments as Garrison's words sunk in. Whoever or whatever was behind the Black Tide, they were taking a place straight from the alien handbook, targeting big cities of major powers. Doc Stevens raised his hand. The man actually raised his hand. King now realized that he wasn't the only one associating the briefing room with a classroom. Wilson waved bored fingers for Doc Stevens to speak up. According to the data that we've collected so far. Thanks, by the way, Miguel. No problem. Anyway, calling this incident Black Tide is a misnomer. It's not made up of water, and as far as we can tell, it's not made up of any substantive matter. Not on a subatomic level, naturally. English! Doc Stevens blushed at Wilson's admonishment, but fortunately got himself together enough to continue. The Black Tide doesn't destroy and move things. It just makes people disappear. We're still debating on whether the tide disintegrates people or simply moves them to another place. It's how they abduct people. 
King tried not to let the heat rise to his face with everyone now staring at him. Maddox leaned over from the back row. Who's they? Everyone in this room knew who they were. No one wanted to be the first to say it. Because it sounded crazy. Because it is crazy. Aliens. The kind who abduct you and slice off your arms. The aliens, said Nelson, totally unapologetic. But everyone was still staring at King. Finally, Garrison asked King what made him think that the Black Tide abducts people. I don't know. I just do. Not one of his best answers. King didn't want to mention that the Black Tide was all he remembered before blacking out three months ago. Yeah, he should mention it, but he felt too exposed. King wondered who would be the first to dogpile on. He could feel sweat prickling on his neck, but no one harassed him over his flimsy response. Not even Wilson. Nelson was the first to break the tension. Do we know what the aliens want? Garrison started to speak, but Wilson cut her off. To experiment on us. Just like Wilson, King thought. Wilson's creepy blue eyes shifted to King. I don't know if they want to cut off our arms like they did to King here. Director. Wilson cut Garrison off again. King's no wilting flower. Yeah, said Miguel. But you don't have to be a dick about it. Maddox leaned forward again. You would know about that, wouldn't you, buddy? Miguel started to rise, but King held him in place with the back of his hand. Literally in place. It was kind of weird to think how strong he was now. Agent Garrison targeted both King and Maddox with a steely glare as she rose from her seat. She joined Wilson, who was sneering, of course. We don't have time for petty squabbling. We're in the middle, or beginning of some, secret alien invasion. Garrison held up her hand to forestall any questions or arguments. Governments worldwide, including our own, seem to be doing everything they can to keep the public from realizing what's happening. Hell, said Maddox. We don't even know what's happening. And that's why, said Wilson, obviously interested in taking back control of the meeting. We're sending you folks out on a recon mission. The alien spaceship. Maddox slapped his knee and laughed hard. <laughs> oh, that's a good one, Director. We don't know where the ship is or how to get onto it. We don't even know how many ships they have. Precisely why we're sending King, Maddox, and Miguel. King shook his head. This was stupid. Beyond stupid. King almost said so. But direct confrontation with the Lazarus Director seldom went well. So King chose his next words carefully. How do you plan to get us onto the alien spaceship? Wilson looked over to Doc Stevens who quickly explained how Lazarus Project has been able to triangulate known black tide incidents happening on the West Coast, primarily happening in Los Angeles County. I think it's highly plausible that the last black tide occurrence happened around you, Agent King. Like I said before, Wilson grinned at King. The aliens see you as an experiment, or a weapon. They'll want to know what happened to your tracking device. Maddox slapped King on the shoulder with the back of his hand. Yes, you're special. No. King pointed to Wilson. They're the ones guessing. You're grasping at straws. All of you. And you're using us as bait. The human race is at stake here, Howie. We're sending the three of you out tomorrow. Assuming that Wilson planned to allow them time to get some shut-eye, that didn't leave much time for prep, let alone a proper recon. Not even a goddamn simulation. All of which pushed this mission even further past the line of recklessness, towards suicidal. King knew he was many things. Suicidal wasn't one of them. Why does Miguel have to go? Wilson leered at King. I thought you didn't mind threesomes, Howie. Don't worry. Nelson will lead the team. From somewhere nearby. What's our objective? Asked Nelson. Even Wilson looked surprised when Doc Stevens spoke up. We could really use some information on the aliens. What they look like, who they're working with, their tech. We already know what they look like, said Nelson. We do? Asked Maddox. King was surprised that Dingleberry was still paying attention. King and I ran into them four months ago. Nelson looked down at King. Isn't that right, Agent King? What do they look like? Asked Miguel. King tried not to shift in his chair, but the memory of fighting those monster things was still fresh in his mind. They look like black werewolves, minus the fur, he finally said. Maddox laughed, slapping his knee again. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Wilson clapped his hands and informed everyone that the meeting was over. Agent Garrison and Nelson followed the Lazarus director out of the room. King and the rest were told to stay. 
Hey, what's this? Insurance. Doc Stevens moved on from Maddox to King and Miguel's row and handed them each an odd-looking red capsule. He could probably tell by the look in King's eyes that King didn't trust pills and capsules from the Lazarus Project. Don't worry, Howard. These are nothing more than measured doses of amphetamine and caffeine. They're time-released. Take them right before your mission. I'm not tired, said King. Then it dawned on him. This pill wasn't to energize him. It was to wake him and the others up after they got abducted by the aliens. Chapter 10 Even after a few hours of sleep, Wilson's plan didn't get any less pathetic. This harebrained scheme would get all three of them killed. King could only hope that Maddox would be the first to get whacked. King didn't mention any of this to Miguel. After all, what was the point? Wilson always got his way. On the upside, at least it was a sunny, fairly warm morning. Mid-sixties. Not exactly atypical of a Southern California morning. Maybe they should stop for a snack or something. He and Miguel had been walking down Sunset Boulevard for almost three hours now, their eyes darting between the windows of glitzy stores. They weren't really shopping, of course. They were bait. King couldn't help but feel a little anxious, exposed. He didn't trust Lazarus Project or the aliens. So, said Miguel, you going to tell me what Wilson meant by saying you like threesomes? King was definitely not going to tell Miguel what Wilson's snide comment meant. Wilson was just being a dick. Miguel gave him a sidelong glance. He wasn't buying it. Hopefully he would let the subject drop. To give Miguel the proper motivation, King stopped in front of the Viper Room. He must have passed the famous nightclub a million times while driving, yet he never noticed the music venue or its jet-black facade. For some reason, King was surprised to see so many cars bumper to bumper and pedestrians. Guess everyone's not worried about the world coming to an end. Maddox was tailing them at a safe distance, but King had lost track of the Lazarus agent a half hour ago. King knew that Nelson was tracking them too. From somewhere. Maybe one of the Strip's hotels. It wouldn't surprise King if the aliens were a no-show, and if they did show up, what the hell were they going to do once they were inside the alien spaceship? Someone screamed. No, lots of people were screaming. Miguel and King's heads snapped back and forth, trying to spot the source of the commotion. There. Miguel pointed east. Then King saw it too. The black tide, roaring down the middle of Sunset Boulevard, like some giant wave of darkness, consuming everything in its path. King felt his heart racing. The damn thing was even scarier in daylight. People started running, some scared enough to run into traffic. They saw a truck smash into one guy before the driver could slam on the brakes. Let's go, yelled Miguel over the ruckus as he pulled King along with the crowd. Running in the same direction as everyone else was the last thing King wanted to do. Let's make a right at that corner. What do you mean? Asked Miguel, following anyway. We want to get caught. I know, King hissed. Just want to see if that thing will follow me. Trying to outrun the black tide was like trying to outrun a hurricane. The black tide was too fast, too powerful. King and Miguel barely made it around the corner. The black waves smashed past them. And then, something strange happened. The black tide double-backed and came rushing down the street they had ducked into. Both men turned to run, but not as fast as they could. Try to stay close. King yelled over the roar of the black wave gaining on them. The black tide crashed into Miguel and King from behind and swept them off their feet, carrying them along like leaves on a stormy sea. The two men locked eyes both knowing that this was what they wanted, both of them wondering if this would be their end. Chapter 11 The Alien Spaceship As King gradually regained consciousness, his brain started to panic. He opened his eyes but still couldn't see. Some kind of slimy goo covered his entire face. Somehow, though, he could still breathe. The black tide left him feeling disoriented, his mind fuzzy. King soon realized he was lying face down on a cold, slimy surface. His head hung limply over the edge. A sharp pain stabbed him in the back of the neck. King gritted his teeth but otherwise didn't move. For now, he would play possum. One of the humans apparently removed the tracker, said someone to King's left. We can replace it. These had to be the aliens. That's right. His mission was to get abducted, so the aliens would take him back to their ship. Doc Stevens' time-released pill must have kicked in. And so far, the aliens didn't seem to know he was awake. King found it odd that the aliens spoke perfect English. Then he realized that it must be the language implant in his brain doing the translating. Bind the tracker to his spinal cord this time. No, 
He couldn't let these freaks do that. King ripped the goo from his face and hoisted himself up onto all fours. Two creatures with reptilian faces and a bad rash stared at him in disbelief. King snatched the blood-covered instrument from the nearest alien's stringy hand, then stabbed him in the eye with it. The alien howled as yellow liquid spurted from his eye. King leapt to his feet and backhanded the second alien, sending it crashing into what looked like medical equipment. The whole area, twice as large as the Lazarus Project's interrogation room, boasted weird-shaped flashing consoles and sickly blue lighting, along with ominous mechanical tools drooping from the ceiling. King realized that he was completely naked. He needed to find his clothes and find Miguel. Maddox might be here too. The two aliens groaning on an impossibly black floor reminded King what he needed to do first. King knelt down by the blinded alien and pulled out what looked like some kind of scalpel from its eye, eliciting more cries of pain from the alien. King jammed the scalpel into the alien's mouth this time, then turned toward the alien's friend. Neither of them would get the chance to operate on him, or anyone else, ever again. The corridor walls, along with being creepy and the opposite of smooth, were a dull metallic gray. If the alien ship was moving, King certainly couldn't tell. This entire place felt... wrong. Kind of like his cybernetic arms. Thankfully the air seemed breathable despite smelling a bit moldy. So far King hadn't come across any more aliens. He had been relatively lucky so far. His clothes were close to where he had woken up, stuffed in a see-through plastic bag. King cautiously made his way toward a bend in the corridor. Lazarus training encouraged agents to stick to shadows whenever possible, but somehow, he knew it wouldn't do any good. The aliens would be able to see him anyway. King didn't know how he knew this, he just did. The ship's metallic, bumpy walls shimmered with a faint blue glow, illuminating his path as King crept deeper into the unknown vessel. Every sound echoed through the empty halls no matter how softly he walked. He had no idea where he was going. Why was it so quiet and where were the other aliens? King got his answer when he reached the bottom of the slope. He smelled them first, thanks to the nanobots in his body heightening his senses. Weaponless, King peeked carefully around the corner. A reptile alien dressed in a leathery commando suit appeared to be supervising five humans. They weren't human, though. They were Amets. The hairless werewolf-like creature he and Nelson had fought months ago. How the hell could he know they were called Amets? The aliens were lined up next to a wall that sported eight human-sized blisters that appeared to be made up of crystal and minerals. One by one, the last Amets pushed themselves through the crystal blisters. The last Amet, though, turned his head in the direction where King was hiding and sniffed the air. The reptile alien who was obviously in charge slapped the Amet aside his head. I smell something, the Amet hissed. Stop dawdling and proceed. The Amet glared at the lead alien, who didn't seem at all bothered by the Amet's murderous stare. The fake human looked in King's direction once more, then turned and plunged his arm through the blister, followed by the rest of him. The reptile alien looked around. Apparently satisfied there was nothing amiss, it strode away. As soon as the alien was gone, King rushed to the port windows. Four tear-shaped crystals pods plummeted toward the clouds below, meaning that the alien ship was hovering in Earth's atmosphere. King watched as the crystal pods disappeared into the clouds, his mind racing over what the Amet's mission could be. He also wondered if any of Earth's governments knew the alien ship was here. And if so, why didn't they shoot it down? Footsteps drew his attention away from the window port. Someone was coming this way and running hard. King quickly hid himself on the left side of the corridor archway, readying himself to strike. The second he saw movement coming through the archway, King pounced. He grabbed the intruder by the back of his collar and flung him into the wall where the crystal blisters used to be. Maddox. King rushed over to the Lazarus agent and offered his hand. Maddox swatted King's proffered hand and forced himself to his feet, pulling up what looked like a laser rifle with him. Once again, King had no idea how he knew the weapon to be a laser. You are right, man? Maddox scowled at King. Like you care. You're right, I don't. We need to find Miguel and get out of here. Our mission is to gather intel. Maddox reached inside his breast pocket and pulled out a thin black item that resembled a lighter. Picture time. Maddox aimed the device at the four remaining crystal blisters. Fine, said King. Have fun taking photos. I'm finding Miguel. So King left Maddox. The next corridor had a couple of doors at least. King sort of felt like he was being watched. Could be paranoia, and there was nothing he could really do about it. 
He would focus on finding Miguel and getting the hell off this ship. Maybe he would get lucky, and Miguel would be behind one of these doors. Before he could check the first door, King heard snarling, and Maddox cursing. Too bad. The jerk should have followed his lead. King hurried over to the first oval door. The odd protruding bump on the door's left would open it. As he reached out to touch it, King noticed movement behind him. King flung himself away from the door, just in time to avoid being slammed in the back by a giant worm-like thing that resembled the surrounding walls. Another one shot out at him from the same wall. King batted it away, noting that the things attacking him possessed a blue ethereal luminescent glow inside of them. They writhed like live wires and slapped at King again. More burst from the walls. King opted to run back the way he came. Great. It was almost like they were herding him back to the Amets or whatever was chowing down on Maddox. He heard laser fire coming from ahead of him. Maybe Maddox had finally figured out how to use the damn thing. King found himself back where he started, the pod area. Maddox was doing a pretty good job of blasting the Amets who were trying to circle him. King was surprised that the black oily creatures were wearing uniforms. One of the Amets must have heard King or smelled him because it reeled away from the melee and hurled itself at him. Instinctively, King lashed out with a right cross. He felt the Amet's bones break and the snout collapse under his fist. King followed that up with a knee to the creature's midsection and tossed it to the side. Maybe Wilson was right. He is a weapon. Unfortunately, this was still pretty much a one-sided fight. There were too many Amets, super aggressive and bloodthirsty, and way too fast. In short, werewolves with yellow eyes, bad breath, and no fur. Two Amets almost cornered him, King felt a jolt of a pain as silver claws ripped at his left side. King punched the offending Amet straight in the nuts. It let out a pained howl and collapsed instantly. The other Amet wasted no time attacking King, succeeding in bowling him over. Only King's cybernetic forearm kept the Amet's jaws from ripping out his throat. Well, this wasn't going as well as he had hoped. Plus, Maddox couldn't keep up despite spraying the Amets with laser fire. Eventually, an Amet got through. The Lazarus agent screamed as the hairless Amet bit into his rifle arm. The Amet then went for Maddox's throat. Then its head exploded, leaving Maddox slapping Amet brain mush from his face. This was enough to snap King out of his daze, so he could focus on the Amet trying to shake King's arm loose with its massive teeth. King hit the thing with an awkward left hook to the side of its face, knocking the Amet off him. King rolled on top of the Amet and clamped one hand onto its thick neck. It tried to throw him off by bucking but King plowed his right hand into its face, collapsing it. Damn. Now he had greasy black blood all over his hand. Well, at least the thing wasn't moving anymore. Which didn't discourage two more Amets from launching themselves at him. There was no way he was going to make it back to his feet in time. Two laser shots whizzed past King. Both Amets' throats now had holes in them. The creatures looked confused as each of them folded to the floor. King looked over his shoulder at the shooter. Miguel. Need a hand, guys? Smiling, Miguel held his left hand out to King. King wasn't sure where Miguel got the laser pistol from, or how he learned to use it, but he was sure happy to see his friend again. King allowed himself to be pulled up. Man, you gained weight. It's the cybernetic limbs. Miguel looked over at Maddox, who was on the floor, his right arm bleeding. You were right, Maddox? Yeah, just give me a moment. We don't have a moment, said King. Six more Amets in human form had entered the pod area. Worse. Each of them appeared to be armed with laser rifles. King wondered if they left Maddox here. Could he and Miguel make it to the pods in time? He was about to push Miguel toward the pods when he saw him. Wilson. Lazarus Project Director. What the hell was he doing here? The Amets parted in the middle to allow Wilson to pass, then followed him over. Hello, Howie. Wilson's evil blue eyes shifted to Miguel, down to Maddox, and back to King. King snatched up Maddox's laser rifle and aimed it at Wilson. What are you doing here? You working with the aliens? Wilson chuckled. There are no aliens, Howie. This is all one big test. What do you mean? Don't listen to him, Hauser. Miguel's laser pistol was also aimed at Wilson. He must be working with the aliens. Wilson glanced at Miguel and just as quickly dismissed him. He's not bad. For a simulation. Simulation? None of this was making sense. And why did his brain suddenly feel foggy? Listen, Howie. You're still physically inside the interrogation room. After you went AWOL for three months, well, we need to know if you've been compromised. 
What about the aliens in my cybernetic arms? I already told you, Hallie. There's no such thing as aliens. As far as your arms, they're as real as mine. Back in the real world, of course. He's lying to you, Hauser. Damn straight. Maddox rose from the floor, still keeping an eye on the Amets. King tightened his grip on the rifle. Get out of our way. We're leaving this place. And go where, Howie? There's no escaping your own mind. Besides, this is your final test. What you do right now will prove whether you're one of us. Wilson tilted his chin toward Miguel. Or a government spy. We have a lot invested in you, Howie. We don't want to lose you. Let me help you. Help me how? Do not listen to him. What do I have to do? King lowered his rifle. Wilson looked genuinely sad when he pointed to Maddox. You have to shoot the meat over there. Hell no. Maddox took a step toward them, but stopped when he saw King's rifle pointed at his chest. It's not like you even like the guy. That's enough, growled Maddox. Not quite enough, said Wilson. You also need to take care of your buddy here, Miguel. No. King's words came out almost as a whisper. Wilson shrugged. I know it's asking a lot, Howie, but this isn't really Miguel. He's part of the simulation, part of the test. Hauser, it'll mean nothing when you kill him and Maddox. Your real friend is back at HQ, waiting for you. Look at me, Hauser. King found himself staring at Miguel. He looked scared, real scared. But he wasn't lowering his pistol. Almost as if someone else was making it happen, King swung his rifle toward Miguel, who was now aiming at pistol at him. I'm sorry, Hauser. I, I can't let the aliens have you. Not again. I'm sorry. This is a pass or fail test, Howie. He shoots you first. You fail. Despite gripping the laser pistol with both hands, Miguel's weapon was shaking. His best bud was actually going to shoot him, unless... He shot Miguel first. You see, Howie? He can't shoot you. He's not even real. Now all you have to do is prove it to yourself. End him. Now. End your nightmare. Rifle still raised, King looked at Wilson. The Lazarus director was right. He could end this nightmare, get his real arms back, be whole again. King's finger tightened on the trigger as he turned his focus back on Miguel. His buddy's eyes were tearing up. Miguel never cries. Shoot him! King whipped his rifle back and fired, blasting half of Wilson's head off. But it wasn't Wilson lying dead on the floor. The three of them looked down at the dead reptilian alien, yellow blood staining its uniform. King fired at the squad of Amits next, blasting three of them before they could return fire. Miguel took out another one. Nice to have you back, Hauser. Jump into the nearest pod, hissed King, shoving Miguel out of the way. That saved his buddy from getting a laser hole in the gut, but the same blast seared off half King's ear. King was the last one inside a crystal pod. He hoped the pods worked on autopilot, or the three of them would soon be splattered all over L.A. Chapter 12 Someone thought it clever to use primary colors for the Pacific Design Center. King didn't. He had seen the West Hollywood landmark in passing before, but never paid it much mind. King immediately spotted Nelson sitting on the design center's steps sipping coffee. Ponytail, no makeup or uniform, still looked good. King approached her at an angle, wondering how long it would take the Lazarus Project agent to notice him. She spotted him almost immediately, even going so far as to offer King a tired smile. Nelson didn't bother getting up when he reached her. Just patted the spot next to her. King sat down and looked at Nelson. So, is this a date? Only for appearances. Nelson leaned over and gave him a light kiss on the lips. In case someone's watching us, right? Someone's always watching, King. He knew she was right. Lazarus really liked keeping track of its agents, which is one of the reasons why they were so pissed he went missing for three months. Three months of his life that he couldn't remember. One would think that you would remember getting your arms sawed off, but King sure as hell didn't. In a sick way, it made sense. Among the many bad things the aliens did to him, mind control listed pretty high judging by what happened back on the spaceship. King glanced over his shoulder at the plumes of water jetting out from the design center's fountain. Jeez, almost 12.30 and almost no one around. 
The traffic was also unusually light, too. Despite the president's television appearances and press releases, people weren't buying the everything's all right routine. So what did you want to talk about? Nelson sighed. Wilson, don't tell me you're in love with him. Nelson gave King a look and shook her head. The only person in love with Wilson is Wilson. I don't know how to say this, King, but... Now that's a first. I'm being serious here. I have a friend, had a friend, in the Lazarus Bio Unit. She was one of the people checking Lazarus Agent's blood. For what? Nelson sighed, then took another sip of her coffee. This was so unlike her usual super-confident self. Checking to make certain that we're... human. King tried his best not to clench his jaw. He did not want to hear what came next. Didn't want to hear that he wasn't... human. I think Wilson... might be an alien. What? King almost felt guilty for being relieved that it wasn't him she was talking about. I know it sounds crazy doesn't make it less true. You got evidence? His blood work is totally classified, but my friend got past the security protocols. Wilson's blood is basically normal, but some of it's... not. King wanted to laugh, and he wasn't buying it. Lazarus probably sent Nelson to test him again. Why are you telling me this? Nelson took a long sip from her white coffee cup before answering. You're the only Lazarus agent I can trust. Well, maybe you shouldn't. King felt bad the moment he said it. What about your technician friend? She's missing. They sat in silence for a good minute or so. King didn't want to believe Nelson. And as much as he liked her, Miguel was the only Lazarus agent he could trust. All right. Thank you, King. Don't thank me. I didn't agree to help you. But if I did, is there anything else I should know? Miguel. What about him? He has alien blood, too. Oblivion, a Shadow Invasion audiobook. Written by Savage Tempest. Copyright 2023.